Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a um, great tour prepared for you guys. Uh, my name is Genesis Rodriguez. I'm a public affairs specialist with the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. And um, here with me, I have a few marine biologists on site. And <clears throat> we also have our environmental scientist, uh, Phil Markle, who's going to be giving us an overview of the program before we go into some of the live footage that we were able to take of our ocean monitoring boat. So before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few things. Um, if you guys have any questions, please use the Q&A feature that's located at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also ask your question live, so you can just use the raise hand feature and then we'll call on you uh, to unmute yourself. And so with that, I will give it up to um, Phil to take it away. Hi, good morning, everybody. And my name's Phil Markle, and I'm an environmental scientist here at the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. For some reason, it is not advancing. You click on the slides once and then you advance. There we go. Thank you. I was trying to use my keyboard. Um, so first off, I'll tell you a little bit, uh, we'll tell you what our mission is here at the Sanitation Districts, and it's to protect public health and the environment through innovative and cost-effective wastewater and solid waste management. And in doing so, convert waste into resources such as recycled water and recycled materials. Now, the topic of today's program really hones in on the protection of, uh, of the environment. What you're going to see today is a small part of our commitment to protecting the environment. But before we get started, I'd like to spend a few minutes giving you a little bit of background about the Sanitation District's waste, wastewater treatment services and some of the environment, environmental monitoring that we do. The Sanitation Districts operates 11 wastewater treatment plants within the County of Los Angeles, and these facilities uh, serve approximately five and a half million people within the county. Okay, there we go. The Joint Water Pollution Control Plant li listed here, JWPCP, is by far our largest uh, wastewater treatment facility, and it serves nearly three and a half million of those people, as well as hundreds of indus industries. In 2020, the, uh, this facility, uh, the waste, uh, the, the treated water flow through this facility averaged about 250 million gallons per day of disinfected secondary treated um, effluent. Uh, the uh, JWPCP treatment facility treats solids from this flow as well as solids from six of our upstream water reclamation plants. As you can see in this figure here, the treated water from JWPCP is conveyed through, um, through two continuously operated outfall pipes um, extending about one and a half miles offshore to a water depth of approximately 200 feet off of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Now, as an agency, we participate and conduct local and regional environmental, environmental monitoring at all of the receiving waters where our treated water is uh, discharged. And we have been for decades, in some cases going back as far as 50 years. We do this to ensure the operation of our wastewater treatment systems and the treated water discharges do not have any environmental impacts. When it comes to our, this, our largest facility in Carson, that receiving water is the coastal ocean off of the Palos Verdes. Peninsula. It is in this coastal area that we collect all sorts of samples ranging from sediment chemistry, water chemistry samples, as well as biological surveys of fish, invertebrates, and uh, other organisms um, in, that, in that particular ecosystem. As an example, here is a figure uh, generated uh, using benthic uh, invertebrate in fauna data collected in and around our outfall off Palos Verdes over the last 50 years. Now I used a few words that you're probably going to hear quite a bit during this tour, so I'll go ahead and define them here. The first one is benthic. What do we mean by benthic? Well, benthic means from the bottom, from the bottom of the ocean. So you'll probably hear the term benthic sediments. Uh, it, those would be sediments, the sand and the silt collected off of the bottom. 
in terms of invertebrates, these are animals without a backbone. Things like crabs, things like worms, and shellfish, and things like that. And um, in fauna, those are the invertebrates that actually live within the grains of the sand and the silt. They're like the little worms and things like that. And we do quite a bit of monitoring for that. Well, getting back to this uh, figure, if you look at the upper left, that was in the early 1970s. And uh, the ecological condition at that time was actually pretty poor as exhibited by the, by the, um, the red and kind of the orangey brown colors. But as time went on and treatment processes, uh, the treatment process technology improved as well as monitoring and controls on industrial discharges became more stringent, things improved uh, down to the bottom right figure, um, the, uh, which is the current, making sure, yeah, uh, current conditions where everything's blue and green. That's indicative of reference conditions, uh, areas, uh, similar areas of the ocean that do not receive any treated water discharges. So we evaluate a whole host of measurements as part of this, um, part of our environmental monitoring. We touched upon the infauna, invertebrates, fish, chemistry in the water, chemistry in the sediments. But the main topic of today's tour is how do we collect this information and how do we collect the samples that are used for these kinds of analyses? Well, that's what we're gonna see today with our virtual tour of our oceanographic research vessel, the Ocean Sentinel, and the scientific, and the sanitation district's uh, boat crew and scientific staff, whose job it is to actually conduct this sampling and collect this information. So to get moving along and get, get going right on to today's tour, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things off to our supervising scientist, Tara, who will be taking you on a virtual tour of the vessel, as well as some of the sampling that they conduct. So I will stop sharing my screen and Tara, go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you, Phil. And happy Saturday to uh, all you joining us on Zoom. My name is Tara Petrie. I'm uh, the supervising scientist of the Marine Biology Group. Joining me is Chase McDonald. He's the group's senior biologist and oversees all the field programs. So with that, let's go ahead and turn it over to Captain Steve so he can take us on a, a tour of the Ocean Sentinel. Hi everybody, welcome aboard the Ocean Sentinel. My name is Steve Gregson. I'm the captain on board here. Um, I've been with the districts for about 33 years. Uh, the vessel here, the Ocean Sentinel, uh, it's, uh, it was built 32 years ago. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, let me, you've seen the workspace right now, but if we'll look aft on the vessel, uh, the boat is 65 feet overall. Um, it's an oceanographic vessel. We're gonna go into the lazarette, which is the furthest aft compartment on the vessel. And I'll show you a little bit down here. This is kind of the meat and potatoes. This is where our winches are located and allows us to go and do a variety of sampling offshore. Let me get in here. Okay. If I could pass Mr. Camera down, I'll kind of show you. Okay, here guys. Wow, look at that. There you go. Anyway, I was talking about trawling. This is our winch. We put it down, located down here in the lazarette. That's three-eighths wire rope. We have about 4,000 feet of it. I think our deepest trawl was in 1,500 feet of water. As you can see, it goes through a block there. It's fair leaded out this little opening in the back of the boat where the net is attached. We'll leave it inside here. It's attached to that swivel, okay? That's what we're gonna go do a little bit later on. Next week, we're going to go out and we're going to be using this other winch here. This is our hydro winch. This is a, this is 3 16th wire rope. It's not as beefy as the main drag winch. As you can see, it's fairly to through that block up through 
There's a hole in the deck there. And when we go out, when we go up there, you'll see the davit. And anyway, this is what we're going to use to lower down that clam shell sampling device. Let me give this to Mr. Camera person again, and I'll be up. So anyway, that's how we deal with kind of this open floor plan. We have the same sampling equipment that's on most vessels, but we just do it a little bit differently. It uh, allows people more access around the deck here. You're not tripping over things. We'll close this up. And uh, here's the davit. The wires hook comes out, comes out here. We'll hook this up to this device. We'll pivot this thing over here. And then the controls are right here. We'll lower it down to the bottom, collect the sample, bring it up, put it in these bins. These bins will go over here. They'll be washed through the sluice box and everything will be caught right here. Cool. I want to show you some of the safety aspects to the vessel. These two white canisters on top of the house there, those are life, life rafts. Uh, number two is a 12-man life raft, Solus. And number one is a 24-life raft, uh, Solus B. The Solus A has more life-saving equipment in it. It would be for overnight excursions and whatnot. Solus B is basically close, coast-wise trips, and that's what we normally do. Solus is just a requirement. It's a, it's a standard in, in, in the industry for the life rafts. Going forward here, this is our lab space. Uh, this is the different gear that we're going to use for the Benthix. Uh, you can see fire extinguishers. Things are labeled, labeled accordingly, accordingly in here. First aid can, um, equipment is there. You can see that because we're on a boat, things roll around. So everything, we have latches kind of safety proof or child proof everything here but it's a necessity so that everything doesn't wind up on the floor when we go forward when we go out to sea uh, this is our galley here's our here's our main table here the same thing with the latches this is for safety so that we the pots the pots don't roll off into the deck uh, the refrigerators have latches on them to keep everything closed um, Tell you what, we'll go downstairs now. Uh, I'll take you into the engine room. Okay. Be careful as you make your way down here. Hold on to the handrails. It's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, sharp drop there. Okay. Okay. We're gonna keep going aft on the vessel. We'll go down into the engine room. The engine compartment here, this is the next compartment forward of the lazarette. This, this aluminum tank here, this is my fuel tank. I carry 1,200 gallons of fuel. This is our generator. It's a 45 kW generator. This is, a, this is a hydraulic pump that runs those winches. The anchor windlass, the steering on, on the vessel here, it's hydraulics. This is a reservoir for the hydraulic fluid. Um, over on the right side of the boat here is all my saltwater pumps, or starboard side of the boat, all my saltwater pumps. I can't say enough good things about Westport Shipyard. Everything running forward and aft, the electrical, the hydraulics, the water lines, they're right there for you to see. It makes it easy to locate things. It makes it easy to maintain everything. The black tank is another hydraulic reservoir. Uh, that high up crane, it runs off the back of this transmission on the, um, on the main engine. These are uh, Cummins QMS uh, 11s. They produce 610 horsepower at 2300 RPM. Uh, moving forward, we'll go into our work area. This is where we do most of our maintenance. We have our tools. A freezer right here for ice. We use a lot of ice for preserving our, our samples. And we'll go a little bit further in here. This is our, our changing area. Nice thing about the boat, the, all the switches are in the overhead. This is our, our, our changing room. Over on the port side, this is our dive locker. We do a lot of, we do a lot of diving out there. They were, they were diving on different stations on the PV coastline way before I came here. So I'm going to say maybe 38 years. Yeah. Uh, 
and going forward here on the starboard side comes into our bathroom or the head. It's similar to what you have at home, uh, a toilet, a sink, countertop. This is our shower right here. And the way that we flush our toilet, a little bit different than what you do at home. Um, we'll push this button and this is a marine head. So what happens, this isn't going overboard. This is going into a holding tank in the bilge. And then at a later date, we're going to go to a pump out location and we'll pump the effluent, our effluent out, the excrement out. But we don't want to, we don't want to discharge anything into the oceans. So pretty much everything is confined here on the boat. And moving forward, the, the stairwell, be careful as you make your way up there. It's a rather sharp, deep incline. Okay. And then we'll go on the outside. I'll show you a little bit of more storage for the vessel. Up underneath the wheelhouse, we have some more storage for us where we, where we put our gear. Here's our anchor, anchor winch. And then we, what's real nice with this vessel, we have a lot of storage. We have storage underneath the bench seats here that we put gear in. Um, and then you can go inside. Don't be afraid. You can go in there. What we have on this side, you can see all the lines that we have that we might use. And then we have the doors. We have the trawling nets back behind you, back aft. And then if you go and you look over on the port side, we have all of our dive tanks here. Right now, we just got through doing dives a few days ago, so the tanks are being filled. This is gear for the trawl nets. And then you can, if you look aft, you'll see all the wiring for the equipment for my, uh, uh, what I have up on the bridge, and we'll go up there next. Okay. Close the door. Okay, guys. So if you follow me up this way, we're going to go up to the wheelhouse of the vessel. I've, we'll show you some of the equipment that we use for doing our monitoring. Um, if you come up here, you can kind of see in some of my instrumentation. Um, I've got a GPS unit here, and I've got some software navigation that runs on my laptop. This is uh, an echo sounder that, or a pedometer. This is showing us we're in 16.15.9 feet of water. This is the radar. This will show me other objects out on the water with me. Let's say if it was foggy. So here, and then we have a camera system throughout the boat so that I can see there's the lazarette that we visited with the two winches. Then here's my engine room. So throughout the trip, I'll go back and forth and then we'll see, we'll see just to keep up on what's going on on the boat. Okay, and then what, what we'll do when we get out there, you'll kind of see how we use everything when we're, when we're doing, actually doing the sample. Okay. All right, now that we've concluded our boat tour, let's go ahead and get those lines untied and, and head out to sea. So today we'll be highlighting a few of our ocean monitoring programs. The first activity we'll demonstrate is fish and invertebrate collection using an otter trawl net, followed by the collection of benthic sediments using a tandem van bean sampler, and concluding with an outfall inspection assessment footage uh, for both diver shallow water portions and uh, deeper portions with our remotely operated vehicle.
All right, so here we are on the back deck of the Ocean Sentinel getting ready to deploy our Auditrol net. This is a standardized net used in ocean monitoring programs to assess the health of demersal fish and epibenthic invertebrate communities. As we deploy the net, we toss in the caught in first. This is the area where the catch will accumulate. Okay, as the rest of the net enters the water, we ensure that there's no entanglements of any of the lines. Okay. okay, so here's a different view of the net going into the water. You can see that caught in going in first, followed by the net. You'll notice some orange floats that are on the, the top line of the net, and that aids in keeping the net um, opened. There's trawl doors that aid in the spreading of the net. I'm just saying that right now you're looking at the back of the boat, the lazarette. Let me turn the volume down. Anyway, there's the winch that the uh, the net is attached to, and we're deploying we're deploying the wire right now. We're going to put out a, a couple thousand feet of wire. That's going to take us about nine minutes to do it. Here's the coastline here. This is our radar. Kind of if it was if it was foggy out, I'd be looking at this all the time. There's kind of the coastline. As you can see right there, uh, let me, I don't see any boats out here with me. There's a boat right behind me because I can see it right there. Our position is the very center, center of the screen. I'm going to go, I'm going to put this to a range that is really is better for me to work with. The closer, the better. I can kind of see things. Uh, let me go a little bit more. Okay. Now here's our depth right here as we're deploying out. We want to start the net, we want to be on the bottom at 430 feet, so we're getting close to that. I'm going to take it off of autopilot. And you can see our spot right here is this is where we're going to. These are all the stations that we visit. The boats is right here. We're doing a course. The course to the station is 112 degrees. Our course right now is 104 degrees. We're making 3.6 knots, which is a little bit slow but I still have four more minutes to go. I got four minutes to go, so I got time to, to change things around, but I'm gonna be looking at all these things as we get ready to be at the station because that's the whole thing. We wanna start very close to that spot. This is a GPS. This is, uh, I'm, 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 what I'm doing with both of, these, the, both of these pieces of information is I'm getting input from satellites overhead. And with that information, I'm able, I'm able, think of this as Uber on the ocean. <laughs> I'm, I'm able to get to the spot. Uber, I'm doing Uber on the ocean. I'm delivering that net to the spot it's got to be. That's, that's my job. All right, so here we are retrieving the net. And as those bridles and yellow cinch line reach the boat, uh, Brent goes down onto the swim step, unclips the cinch line. He'll get that handed up to Chase. Chase will then wrap that around the capstan of the crane. By us using a, a cinch line, it allows for the crane to take the load of the catch rather than us having to pull it up by hand. the bridles are getting pulled in, but the load is on that stitch line.
And here's a different view of the net being retrieved. You can see that caught in is very full. We use the crane to aid in, in hoisting the catch onto the boat. Yeah, to help keep the animals alive, uh, we have that live well that is filled with ocean water. All right, now that we have uh, dumped the catch out, normally what we do for our compliance monitoring is we'd sort out all the fish into species. We would process each individual fish. We get uh, the identification, the count, all of them get put together for an overall combined weight. For the inverts, we identify them, we count them, and we weigh them as well. Uh, for today's purposes though, what we've done is we've separated out some of the more interesting animals. And so Brent will uh, start us off with giving us some fun facts about the fish. Hi, my name is Brent. We're going to start off today by talking about the California scorpion fish. Um, it's one of our local fish, uh, popular among the anglers. Um, it's extremely tasty. Um, they can get to be uh, about 18 inches long. Um, they'll live for about 50 years. Um, these guys here, one thing you need to be worried about, they call them the scorpion fish for a reason. They are slightly poisonous, so all the dorsal spines, the pelvic spines, and the anal spines are all filled with the venom. Um, so that's why I'm kind of holding them here carefully. Uh, this is an ambush predator. It's got a really large mouth. Typically, they'll just sit down on the rocks, uh, unaware, and just wait for things to go ahead and swim on over it. Um, Brent, what else do we have? So while we're still sitting here with our benthic fish that are ambush predators, we have our uh, midshipmen. Um, again, small, wide-bodied out, um, but a really large mouth. So it's just going to sit there, wait for something to swim over it, open its mouth, and it actually creates enough pressure, it'll suck the fish into it. It doesn't actually have to go up and grab it. Um, the other one here is a... Stargazer. This is another one that likes to bury itself in the sand. Uh, it's called a stargazer because it'll just sit there and only have its eyes above the sand. And you can see it's got this nicely large upturned mouth. Something will swim over it and it'll just reach in there and go ahead and bite whatever swims over. So it's a stargazer. These ones here have slight venom in these upper spines here, but not as bad as a scorpion fish. And what are all these dots that I see along the side of the, the fish? So all the dots on the midshipmen here are actually photophores. So these house bioluminescent uh, bacteria inside, and they can open and close the, uh, the cells and uh, actually create light underwater. And they can use it for species identification and communications. So these are some of our local rockfish species. Uh, rockfish are really important members of the local community. Um, they're slightly problematic as far as management goes. They're very slow growing, and they can be really long lived. Um, so like this, uh, the half-banded rockfish here, they can get to be about 10 inches long, or I'm sorry, 15 inches long, and wait, 10 inches long and live for 15 years. Um, and then we have uh, this green stripe one up here, which can get to be closer to 20 inches long and live for close to 50 years. Um, and just like people, they're not able to reproduce until they're about 15 years old. So you can see if you start to take them out too early on, they never get a chance to reproduce and you have a lot of issues with the populations. Um, we have here, so we have a green stripe and we have a green blotch, a couple of the different ones. This one here is known as a half-banded. It has a band that goes halfway down. And these are some of our local species. So what we have here is we have a couple of flatfish species. Um, this one here actually has a gill parasite that was uh, coming out of its gills there. So this is an isopod. So think about your little roly-polies from your garden. This is one of its marine cousins. Um, it's a parasite, like I said, so it's going to go in there. It crawls into the gill cavity, attaches onto the gills, and then just like a vampire sucks the blood. Um, and it'll stay there. Um, luckily, it's a good parasite, so um, it's not going to kill its host. It's just going to sit there for a very long time and allow it to do all of its work. Um, but these are a couple of our flatfish species. So we have our Pacific sand dab and our local English sole. Uh, one of them happens to be, if you notice, they face different directions. So one's known as a left-eyed and one's known as a right-eyed. So this is our right-eyed fish. Sorry, left-eyed fish, because I'm looking at it backwards. Yeah. And this one's right-eyed. Wait, am I? Right. Right? Okay, yeah. I was back. Okay. Right Good. Like that. Um, what will happen is when these are larvae, they actually start off just like any normal fish. They have their eyes on both sides, on one on each side of the head, and they'll swim around just like nice and normal. And then as it starts to settle and become an adult, the head actually goes through a metamorphosis, and both eyes roll around to one side of the skull, and that way it can go and settle down there and lives flat on the bottom. 
Um, you know, one other thing you'll notice here is the counter shading that they exhibit. So the side that's always up and visible is going to be a dark brown, so it blends in with the sand. The other side, they don't bother wasting any energy making pigment, since it's never going to be exposed. And if they do happen to come off the sand, then it's slightly colored like looking at the sky. Okay. That was great, Brent. Thank you for all those fish fun facts. Now we're going to turn it over to uh, Chase, and he'll talk to us about some of the interesting invertebrates that we got in the catch. All right, Chase, what do we, what do we have? All right, we got, um, usually on our trawls, we'll catch a wide variety of uh, inverts. We'll catch uh, lots of different types of shrimp, some crabs. Um, uh, so usually we'll catch octopus, uh, urchins. So uh, in this one, we got a few different things. We've got a couple different types of shrimp. Here we have uh, the larger one is a spot prawn, and the, uh, the smaller one is a ridgeback prawn. Both of these are commercially fished because they're both uh, considered good to eat. Um, yeah. An interesting thing about the spot prawn is it starts its life as a male, and as it grows older, it switches and turns into a female. And as you can see, the spot prawn has this really long rostrum. So they use that as a, as a defensive mechanism. A lot of things like to, uh, when they, uh, like fish, likes to eat shrimp, and when they do, they like to grab it by the head, and when you got a big, Big spear sticking out of your head. It's, it's kind of a deterrent. Uh, one of the uh, most abundant things that we catch, especially in our deeper trawls, are these uh, urchins. This is called a fragile urchin. Uh, and it's cr close really, closely related to the purple urchin that you'll see maybe if you go tide pooling. Um, this guy lives in uh, soft, muddy sands, and it, it's it will eat detritus using its mouth parts here. And detritus is just kind of a organic material that's fallen to the, uh, the bottom, like little pieces of kelp, uh, maybe little pieces of uh, dead animals. So it will eat those as compared to its um, relative, the purple urchin, that will eat uh, actually live kelp plants growing on reefs. Uh, another one we caught today, this is a, a sea slug, it's called the California sea slug, and uh, it's related to the sea slugs you might find, or not the sea slugs, just the slugs that you would find in your garden, except it's a lot bigger, and this is actually kind of a smaller one, they'll get big enough where you kind of have to pick them up with uh, both hands, so they're kind of neat, they have this uh, large foot on the bottom they use to uh, crawl around, and then right here you can see is their, uh, their mouth. And it's kind of interesting. These are actually, they might not look like it, but they're actually ferocious predators. Anything that they can grab with their little mouth, they'll kind of grab onto and pull in, pull. So like little fish, crabs, other, other sea slugs, they're, uh, they're not too discriminant on what they eat. But also, they'll eat anything they can grab a hold of. Alright, so that was a brief demonstration of our trawling activities. So next we'll continue on with the benthic sediment collections. So here we are getting ready to deploy our tandem van bean sampler. This is a standardized sampler used in ocean monitoring programs. One side will be used for biological assessment of in faunal communities, and the other side will be used for sediment chemistry analysis. So on deployment, the jaws of the sampler are cocked open, and when the sampler hits the ocean floor, it allows for slack in the triggering mechanism and the jaws will close hopefully at that point scooping up full van beans but we really won't know until the van bean gets back on deck and we open up those top doors
Okay, so in order for us to be able to accept a sample, there needs to be a minimum of eight centimeters of sediments. Ten and a half. their composition based on how they feel. soil color chart developed by I believe the US Department of Geology and it's just a standard set of colors for describing soils so 2.5 y 3 over 1 2.5 y 2.5 over 1 Even though that may look like a pile of 
dirt or debris or sticks. It's actually worm tubes. And there's live worms inside of this. All the clay and silt goes away and we get left with essentially most of the here and some of the tubes, a little thing that will fit through the, the mesh. So I'm adding magnesium sulfate, which is a, a fancy word for uh, Epsom salt solution. So we use that to relax the animals for about 30 minutes before we will preserve them with a formaldehyde solution. Then we'll go through after we put the majority of everything into the container. We'll go through with little tweezers and get the rest of the stuff. Just the little animals. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, that was a brief overview of our, our benthic survey. Uh, next, we'll be moving on to our ocean outfall inspection assessments. All right, so here we have the district's dive team members preparing to dive on the shallower portions of the outfalls. The districts conducts annual external visual inspections of the outfall structures to ensure their continued safe operations. Okay. As we jump into the water, uh, Percival lowers down the scooters, which help us to propel along the outfalls. All right, so here we're on the 120 inch outfall. And as you can see, there's a lot of marine life that's on and surrounding the outfalls. Uh, there's several different fish species. There's kelp and gorgonians that are attached to the outfall. This is the, the 60 inch outfall. And again, you can see all the marine life that's blanketing the outfalls. There's lots of wavy top sea snails more Gargonians. This is the point of the outfall where it's nearly at the point of where it goes below grade. Okay, so this is our remotely operated vehicle, also referred to as an ROV. So during the operations, the ROV remains tethered to the boat by an umbilical cable and the piloting is done uh, within the lab area. So as you can see here, uh, this is the end structure of the 120 inch outfall. There's several vermilion rockfish congregating near the outfall as well as uh, giant humus anemones that are attached to the outfall structure. The outfall structures essentially act as an artificial reef providing habitat and relief in an otherwise relatively flat ocean floor. So this is a, a flowing port and it's surrounded by pink strawberry anemones. As the effluent exits the port, there is a shimmery appearance. And this is because the effluent is of different salinity and temperature than the surrounding ocean water. And this will uh, quickly dissipate as the waters mix. All right, 
So the other marine biology group conducts a variety of other ocean monitoring programs. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed the few that we have selected to share with you. Um, also, we'd like to thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Genesis. Hello. Hi. All right. We got some questions for you, Tara and uh, Phil and Chase, who's hiding somewhere back there. So let's see. First question. Um, where does the ocean sentinel live? Yeah, our ocean sentinel, it's in um, the Cabrillo Marina down in uh, San Pedro. Stock there, we have a pretty nice stock. Or it's been there for, uh, I think, as long as we go in the boat. It's pretty nice. OK, cool. So there is another question that asked if that's Redondo Beach and that answer. No, 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 that's San Pedro. Cool. So next question, how far is the outfall pipe outlet from the field where the DDT dumping was taking place? And do these contaminants affect your data? Um, I, I think I can take that one. Um, our outfall is a mile and a half offshore and 200 feet of water depth. Um, the, the barrel dumping location is about three quarters of the way, half, about half to three quarters of the way to Catalina in 3,000 feet of depth. And so they are completely isolated. Um, uh, you know, uh, things can move around, but that's a pretty drastic, you know, 3000 feet to 200 feet of depth and, and to get stuff moving kind of uphill is, is probably unlikely. Um, it's possible some fish maybe maybe moving stuff around, but no, it, it, it's, it's probably insignificant at, at best uh, in terms of impacting our site. Okay, and uh, the next question, at what depths are you sampling and with what frequency? Well, I'll probably give that off to Tara because we're doing, you know, we don't just test right at our outfall, which is, you know, 200 feet. I mean, we're, we're, we're you, we're testing a wide band there. So what is the ranges over there, Chase? Yeah, for, uh, typically we do some stuff pretty shallow in I, like our, our benthic sediments where we're taking grabs of the sediment. We will, um, it ranges from our shallowest that we do is about a hundred feet. And then the deepest we do is about a thousand feet. And then it's kind of the same for the trawls we do a series twice a year of 16 trawl sites around the Palos Verdes Peninsula. The shallowest we do is, again, around 75 feet. And our deepest trawls are about 1,000 feet. Occasionally, about five times a year, we'll do some regional um, sampling that we coordinate with other agencies around Southern California. And those will go, we'll sample a little deeper. Sometimes we'll do um, uh, some benthic grabs up to almost uh, 3,000 feet deep, and uh, we might go trawling up to almost 1,500 feet deep. Wow, well, and do you ever get seasick out on the boat? Yes. <laughs> uh, occasionally, Wait, yeah, if it's, uh, if it's rough out there. I know I, I'll feel it sometimes. So yeah, just kind of makes for a fun day. Um, okay, so the next question is about the fish and if you keep them alive. When we're doing the, um, the trawl, we uh, try to do our best to process the fish. We have to go through, measure and ID everything. We try to process the fish and get them back into the water as, uh, as efficiently as we can. There's a few programs where we're actually monitoring for the chemicals within the tissues. So for those, we'll actually take the fish back to the lab. All right, so the next question we have is uh, how many collection trips take place during the work week and how many crew members go each time? Yeah, it all depends on the, uh, um, the sampling that we're doing. So uh, like the benthic grabs, uh, we go out uh, once a year for that. That takes uh, about three or four days of like eight hour days to get everything we need. 
and usually there's um, six or seven or eight people out on that. Trawls, we go out twice a year and for about a week each time. And usually we have a little bit more people out there, about eight, eight nine or 10 people out there. Uh, then we're continuously doing other things throughout the year. We're collecting water samples. Sometimes it just takes two people to go out on our smaller boat to collect those. Yeah. So I, we, we keep busy throughout the year. Yeah, the second part of the question was, does each team have their own testing regime? Does each team have their own, what was that? Their own testing. Their own testing. Well, I, yeah. I think, are they cross-trained? Do you have a certain group that oh, just does benthics? Yeah. Do you have a certain, that's what I'm guessing. Is oh, yeah. Yeah, we have, we have, I think, about eight people here in our lab. And we're pretty, most of us are all pretty much trained to do all the sampling that takes place. Right, next question. Do you guys ever eat the fish? <laughs> uh, typically, no. Hey, we, we're just, uh, yeah, scientific collecting and then process and throw back. I, I think it's, it's, it's valuable to note our, our permit doesn't allow for that. It, it's not that we wouldn't if we could, but the collection permit doesn't allow for it. <laughs> so the next question, uh, there, there's two very similar ones uh, about the Hyperion, the recent Hyperion issue. Um, the more detailed question, how much damage does the frequent sewage spills off of Long Beach do to the seed life? Um, and then do you know if there are any efforts to fix things so that we don't have this sewage problem that closes the beaches? Well, I can definitely start off with, because um, I think there were, I think I saw a few questions about the, the, the recent uh, spill at Hyperion. Um, just because there might be other people that might be confused. There are two agencies that operate uh, similar treatment facilities in the Los Angeles County area. It's us, the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts and our Joint Water Pollution C Control Plant, which is what you saw today. And then there is the City of Los Angeles's Bureau of Sanitation Hyperion facility, um, a very similar facility. Um, up near El Segundo. Um, so yeah, the Hyperion spill was part of the, the Bureau of Sanitation and I don't have any information other than anyone would just from reading the, the reports because that's a, that's a separate, that's a separate um, uh, entity altogether. Um, as far as, you know, the uh, environmental impacts of say, you know, smaller spills that may come through um, is probably very minimal because A, they, they tend to be rare and they tend to be relatively small, but there's always a, a, a human health, a public health in terms of swimmers at the beaches depending upon where those spills may occur and where they might actually get to. Um, so that's the biggest concern with spills in general is more of the human health, not the environmental. Awesome. And then before we go to the, before we go on to the next question, I do have a poll. So if you guys could please answer the poll. It's a very quick question. Uh, we're always looking for feedback and suggestions to make our tours uh, better. So you can please uh, answer the poll and then I'll get on to the next question. Um, this one, have you ever been bitten by a sea slug? Um, no, no, yeah, I've never been bitten by the uh, sea slug, although uh, it wouldn't hurt much. It's a uh, mouth part uh, inside. It has what's called a radula, which is, it's kind of kind of the same texture as sandpaper, and they use that to grab onto things. So um, I'm big enough that I'm not going to get uh, eaten by a sea slug. I have been bitten by a octopus a couple of times. Uh, they have a little beak that they use to, uh, they like to eat crabs and shrimp and stuff like that they, they use to eat those. So I have been bitten by an octopus a couple of times mm -hmm. and it stings a little bit, but it wasn't too bad. I think it was funny you referred to them as ferocious predators and they're like little balls of... <laughs> if, you were, yeah, if you're a little bit smaller than one of those, you, you should be scared. Yeah. 
there. All right. So um, the next question is, how did you end up securing your jobs and what education experience or volunteer activities? Who do you want to start with? <laughs> yeah. I think this is for each of you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I went to, I got my uh, bachelor's degree in marine biology at Cal State Long Beach. Go Beach. Go Beach. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, then I got a, um, actually one of the professors there recommended me to a job in the toxicity lab at uh, LA County Sanitation District. So I started there. I worked there for a year and then a position opened up in the marine biology lab. And I was able to transfer over to that. And I've been there ever since. Great. And I too went to Cal State Long Beach. Go, Go Beach. Beach. Um, <laughs> while I was uh, still uh, you know, working on my education, I was able to do an internship um, over in the Upper Newport Bay on behalf of the Fish and, and Wildlife. And while I was there, I met the uh, president of a marine biological consulting firm based out of Orange County, MBC. And uh, he had recommended that uh, I put in an application because they were gearing up to do a really big plankton study. And so uh, fortunately, I was able to uh, get a position in the industry right out of college. And I was with them for eight years and learned a lot of wonderful training skills. And uh, then I came to the districts uh, about 11 years ago. So I'm probably the oldest Cal State Long Beach marine biology graduate amongst the three of us. So I got my bachelor's degree from Cal State Long Beach, started working at the sanitation districts, and while working at the sanitation districts, ended up getting my master's degree in environmental management. So that's my story. I didn't, re I didn't realize we were all from Long Beach. I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they have a great marine biology program. So not surprised. Yes, they do. <laughs> all right, so um, next question. Are the county and city sampling methods slash regimens similar? And do you guys compare your data? Um, I'll, I'll at least start answering that. And yes, they are, because a lot of the work we do is permitted by the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board, and we're both um, uh, regulated under that same board. So our permits are, are, are very, very similar. So obviously, they have a different area that they're monitoring because they're outfalls in, a, in Santa Monica Bay, and it's, it's the potential to impact um, the area is different than ours. Uh, just in terms of geography, but they are very, very similar. We do share our reports that we that we provide as part of our regula regulatory reports, not only with the Bureau of Sanitation, the city of LA, but also uh, with other dischargers in other regional boards like Orange County Sanitation, which is part of the Santa Ana region or the city of San Diego, which is part of the San Diego regional board. So yeah, we do a lot of sharing and we will also, and I think Chase touched upon it, um, we do a five-year collaborative where we look at the entire uh, bite, Southern California bite region all the way across, and we'll do some collaborative monitoring for that as well. Okay, cool. And then the next question is, will this recording be available later to us for viewing? Yes, um, this video will be posted on our YouTube channel. It should be posted by later today, but I'll tell you for sure by tomorrow. Um, also, feel free to check out our next tours. Um, if you go to lacsd.org slash tours, which I can put on the chat, um, you can see a list, a, a schedule for all the tours that we have coming up this, this, uh, this year. And then next month, we'll be taking a tour of our nearest uh, wastewater treatment plant. It's our largest wastewater treatment plant, which is also home to the laboratory where um, Tara and Chase uh, do their work. So with that, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, we really enjoyed having you. If you have any other questions that you think about later, feel free to email us at info at lacsd.org and we'll make sure that your questions get to the appropriate person. And then I'm also gonna put the, um, lacsd.org slash tours. Oh, also make sure that you follow us on uh, 
Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. We also post all of our upcoming tours and little tidbits and fun facts throughout the way. So with that, thank you. Oh, I think we have, um, oh, we had a question. That was great. So thank you, Tara. Thank you, Chase, Phil, and everyone else on the boat that, um, that helped. So thank you so much and have a great weekend. All right, Bye. Bye.